we're going to launch our first new segment, uh, which we call Screeching or Teaching. So, Screeching or Teaching is a segment on the show where I will be looking at uh, some content out there, some videos, uh, very likely, maybe social media posts, uh, perhaps some audio uh, of influencers, thinkers out there, uh, people who are having an impact and s- determining whether or not what they're saying is uh, screeching or teaching, okay? We would welcome it. So I want to introduce you to a fellow that uh, wasn't around four years ago when we took our indefinite hiatus, as I called it back in episode 200. Uh, in fact, I think he's just been around for a couple years. Uh, he's built a, a decent large following already. His name's Dan McClellan. He's a, he's a sharp thinker. All right, certainly don't want to denigrate his intellect. He is a sharp thinker, uh, very intelligent. He's got pieces of paper on the wall uh, behind him, just like me, okay? He's got them from different institutions. But I want to, we'll watch two videos. One, I want to introduce you to who Dan is uh, and talk about, uh, you know, basically introduce you to who he is because I want you to have a background because he's going to be this face that comes on the program. uh, Well, we're going to be commenting on Free and fair use, of course, critiquing, uh, sometimes agreeing with him, uh, but more times it's going to be disagreement. Uh, He fascinates me because he is what I call a progressive Mormon. His philosophical way of interpreting the Bible and other documents comes from a critical theory lens, not critical race theory, but more broadly critical theory. It's the same sort of concept. Uh, and he holds some odd philosophical views, and yet he continues to identify as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I just don't get why, because the beliefs he holds and what he teaches on his YouTube channel is in direct conflict with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. Mormons. So this guy, he's fascinating to me. So let me introduce you to him. We're going to watch this video. Then we're going to watch another one where it's going to relate to the Uh, content of the first half of the program uh, on our Mormons Christians. So we'll look at that. But first, let's watch this uh, two and a half minute clip introducing you to Dan McClellan. Hey, everybody. My name is Dan McClellan and welcome to my channel. This channel is here to try to help make the academic study of the Bible and religion a little more accessible to the general public, as well as to try to help combat the spread of misinformation about the Bible and religion. A little bit about me, I have four degrees in biblical studies. My first was a bachelor's degree in ancient Near Eastern studies. BYU, you see it right there in the closed captioning, BYU. Studies from Brigham Young University. My second is a master's degree in Jewish studies from the University of Oxford, where I wrote my thesis under the supervision of Dr. T. Michael Law on anti-anthropomorphism. And- Let me just pause here and say, it's, uh, it's, it's odd. Uh, when people will cite their master's theses. It's just not something that folks with terminal degrees do. Uh, So it's just a point of observation here. Obviously, I'm implying a little something too, but you will get the sense that Dan is highly educated. And the source text of the ancient Greek translation of the book of Exodus. My third degree is a master's degree in biblical studies from Trinity Western University in lovely British Columbia, Canada, where I wrote my thesis under the supervision of Dr. Craig Broyles on the conceptualization of deity in the Hebrew Bible through the methodological lens of cognitive linguistics. Okay, I got to pause there. That is a mouthful. What does he mean? Let me try to simplify this for you. And we can just look at the closed captioning here. His thesis on the conceptualization of deity, so the concept of God, the concept of God in the Hebrew Bible, so for Christians, the Old Testament, the concept of God in the Hebrew Bible through the lens of cognitive linguistics, so studying language, right? Uh, How we think about the concepts, what we think about language itself, philosophy of language, okay? So that was his third degree, and that was his master's thesis. Through the methodological lens of cognitive linguistics. 
My fourth degree is a PhD in theology and religion from the University of Exeter in the UK, where I wrote my doctoral dissertation under the supervision of Professor Francesca Stavrikopoulou on the conceptualization of deity and divine images through the methodological lenses of both cognitive linguistics and the cognitive science of religion. And again, a mouthful, uh, it's a bit academic. The concept of God and divine images through the lens of cognitive linguistics, there it is again, and science of religion. All right, so science of religion is fascinating. Uh, this comes from a more sociological outlook, what we observe about religious people, rather than the study of theology itself. That's a separate uh, way of studying God, if you will. A revised version of my doctoral dissertation was published in 2022 by SBL Press as an open access volume entitled Adonai's Divine Images, A Cognitive Approach. And you can freely access that volume through the link on my link tree. Now, I am an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Hide it. In fact, I was an employee of he the church for, the for church. over a decade. I worked as a scripture translation supervisor up until January of 2023. However, I am not here to represent the church, neither as a member nor as a former employee. I yeah, he, he, he certainly is not representing the church because what he teaches on his YouTube channel is explicitly contrary. It is contradictory to uh, various doctrines, uh, both core doctrines of God, but also ethics uh, with the Mormon church. It, this guy really is fascinating to me. I'm not here to defend, share, or spread their ideologies or their doctrines. He calls I'm them ideologies. <laughs> as best I possibly can, a critical academic approach to the study of the Bible and religion. And obviously, pure ob objectivity is not possible. Uh, that's not obvious to me, Dan. But as a specialist in the cognitive science of religion, I spend an unsettling amount of time thinking about my own biases and how they influence my work. So. Let me follow up with what I said. We can't be, you know, objectively pure. I think we can know things. There are some things with which we can know with pure objectivity, uh, even just simple things. Uh, we can give some examples. So obviously a uh, loaded one, I'd say uh, Joseph Smith uh, made up the Book of Mormon. Uh, that's what the vast majority of the world believes. Uh, I, I see no reason for thinking that he received the revelation. Uh, you also think that the Book of Mormonism has no historical grounding. We're going to get into this, of course, through videos in the future. So really it is fascinating uh, that I think we can uh, come to conclusions, objective conclusions of reality. Now, surely there's a lot of things where our biases play in. And uh, so we'll get into that more as the videos go along. So I work harder than most to try to recognize and ferret out any such biases and any such influence in my work. So I hope while you're on my That's channel, admirable. you will find something educational. You will find something uplifting, maybe even entertaining. And I appreciate your time very much. All right. So that's Dan. And now I wanted to uh, get into one video. He's got a lot of videos. You can see here he's got, you know, 52,000 subs. He's got a lot of videos. So let's jump into one video related to our topic today about what is a Christian. Uh, I just searched his channel for the word Christian. I thought maybe there might be something on there about whether Mormons are Christians. Uh, and lo and behold, this video just came out uh, last month in March of 2024. And there's our friend, uh, Michael Jones, Inspiring Philosophy. Uh, so this is a response video Dan does to Michael uh, on the No True Scotsman fallacy. So you'll have to bear with me a little bit. I'll help wade through this discussion. But why is this important? You're going to see in this video, Dan is going to say some peculiar things. And we're also going to recognize some of his assumptions on our debate on our uh, internal discussion from the first half of the program. So without further ado, we'll get this playing. The first minute will be Michael describing the No True Scotsman's fallacy, and then Dan will jump in. We Christians are not committing a No True Scotsman fallacy when we note Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, and even some progressive Christians are not really Christians. All right, let's see it. And the fit for this video is dead. Uh, Dan has that catchphrase. All right, let's see it. And he's wearing like a new shirt in, in every the video. The reasoner recharacterizes the situation solely in order to escape refutation of the generalization. 
To better explain what that means, we can look at the original example that Anthony Flew came up with when he coined the fallacy. No Scotsman puts sugar on his porridge, but my Uncle Angus is a Scotsman and he puts sugar on his porridge, but no true Scotsman puts sugar on his porridge. As you can see, for the first person, what makes someone a true Scotsman is some arbitrary or ad hoc reason that really has nothing to do with being a Scotsman. So this is not accurate. The fallacy does not depend upon the identified feature being arbitrary or meaningless. The fallacy depends upon a generalization being altered so that the boundaries are constricted and a provided counterexample is definitionally excluded. So a no true Scotsman fallacy is when we start with a generalization and someone provides a counterexample and then we change the generalization in order to omit that counterexample. So let me say here, I am not interested in going knee deep into the weeds on who's right, Michael or Dan, but basically what follows here is what I'm interested in. So I'm happy to use Dan's explanation here and to work from, from there. There are multiple steps in a no true Scotsman fallacy. So just denying broadly that Mormons are Christians is not even eligible to be considered a no true Scotsman fallacy because there is not a generalization that has been altered. Someone is just asserting necessary and sufficient features for membership in the category of. All right, so now we're in it. Okay, so Dan is saying here that you can't say Mormons are not Christians because you're just making a an assertion. All right, you're just you're just putting it forward. All right, Christian. And this is not what we Christians are doing when we note someone like a Mormon is not really a Christian, because we're not dismissing their claim to be a Christian from an arbitrary reason, but from a meaningful reason. So that has no relationship to a no true Scotsman fallacy. So if someone just says, oh, Mormons aren't Christians because of X, that's not a no true Scotsman fallacy. However, if they say, well, Christians believe this, and somebody says, well, what about Mormons? And they say, well, real Christians, or authentic Christians, or orthodox Christians, uh, or historical Christians, or something like that, that then becomes a no true Scotsman fallacy. Yeah, so here, here Dan is right. You wouldn't say that, well, that's not a real Christian. You would just say, that's not Christian. You'd say, what Mormons believe is not Christian. That's all you have to do to avoid the no true Scotsman fallacy. You wouldn't actually say there's, uh, that that's not a real Christian. Uh, what Mormons believe isn't real Christianity. You just say it's not Christianity. Plain and simple. So, but this gets even better. See, because the generalization has been altered to definitionally exclude the provided counter example. And in that case, it doesn't matter if the feature that is identified is meaningless or meaningful or arbitrary or not, because what matters is whether or not the generalization has been altered. Words have to have a coherent meaning. No, they don't. And we Christians... What? What? This, this is mind-boggling to me. You got this sharp guy, highly educated, and what does he say? because what matters is whether or not the generalization has been altered. Here we go. Words have to have a coherent meaning. No, they don't. Words, ha Michael says words have to have a coherent meaning. And Dan says, no, they don't. I'm sorry. Dan, if you're watching this, Michael's not saying that words have intrinsic or absolute value. He's saying they just have to have coherent meaning. And you're objecting to that. This is wrong on so many levels. Words are symbols of sounds, and the speaker creates meaning to the sound or the written symbols. So there is authorial intent. Now, maybe you want to say there's like read a response intent that we can't really know. Think like Gadamer, right? We can't really know what the text says. So we give it meaning, okay? Let's say that's your view here. I'm not saying that is because I haven't watched enough of your videos, but I've watched enough that intrigue me. Uh, if that's your view, you're still saying that there's coherence because the self at least creates something from the symbols. So the symbols mean something, but 
even that is just totally bunk because when you are listening to Michael, you are understanding what he's saying. So you are interpreting meaning that Michael has conveyed through the video, through the audio, the words themselves, and you have, or you are at least trying to, understand him. So I think it's just outrageous to say that words don't have coherence. They don't have to have coherent meaning. What, they could have incoherent meaning? They could have no meaning? What are you even talking about in linguistics, if that's the case? Please, I welcome a response. I welcome a, I'd welcome a discussion on this. Uh, but this is one red flag, I would say, where you can begin to see some peculiar philosophical assumptions that Dan has. And we Christians are allowed to define the boundaries of our own belief system and what we mean by the term Christian, which we use to describe ourselves. So that would be all and good if all people who identified as Christian had a seat at the table and had oh, a hand in determining. There it is. Let's go. Let's go back. We'll replay this. This is critical. Uh, also, I see philosophical has everything I've said to you, Doctor Jay, has no meaning. <laughs> That's exactly the point, that we use words to communicate to each other. So there is coherent meaning. I'm not saying there's absolute meaning. It always means the same thing in every context because language does evolve. But there's still a general understanding for communication to exist. So yes, funny point, philosophical dad, nicely done. Uh, okay, let's go back here because we want to define what a Christian is. And look at how, watch how Dan defines it. He doesn't define it, he just, he slips it in. You ready? Here we go. To define the boundaries of our own belief system and what we mean by the term Christian, which we use to describe ourselves. So that would be all and good if all people who identified as Christian had a seat at the table and- Boom, there it is. Did you catch it? All people who identify as a Christian. This was the problem we wanted to avoid at the outset of today's core program, when we're trying to figure out what is a Christian. The problem is, one of the problems, is that people will call themselves Christians, but they do not follow Jesus, okay? They do not follow Jesus, both in the ethical practice and the propositional beliefs we can hold about who Jesus is, all right? So, but yet they'll say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. How many people in America say, I'm a Christian? but don't do X, Y, and Z. They don't love their neighbors. They're filled with hatred. They're, uh, they lose their tempers. Um, they're sleeping around with people. Uh, they are, are physically abusive, right? I mean, those are all hall hallmarks of people uh, who are not following Jesus. So that's the issue I want to avoid, and that's Dan's standard. It's anybody who self-identifies as a Christian. That's a terrible way of trying to figure out who is a follower of Jesus and who is not. And had a hand in determining what the criteria and methodologies were going to be for drawing the boundary around the concept of Christian. But that's not Okay, all right, this is easy. This is really easy because uh, it's not up to anybody who self-identifies as a Christian to determine what a Christian is. It's the people who follow Jesus. So those are his disciples, and his disciples passed along the teaching, the apostolic teaching. Again, this isn't apostolic secession, but the apostolic teaching, which has been faithfully preserved. And so the apostolic teaching has been faithfully preserved throughout the early decades and centuries of the Christian church. Plain and simple. Those are people who believe what Jesus taught, believe the truths about who he is, and also follow the ethical practices, all right? So it's not anybody who just wants to say, I'm a Christian, and that they get a seat at the table. You have to first decide who does get a seat at the table. And it's not going to be the people from a thousand, you know, 5,000 miles away who were never part of uh, the, the ap receiving the apostolic teaching. If you just say that you follow Jesus, that's not good enough. In fact, that's a terrible methodology for determining who even gets to determine the criteria. It's not what's going on here because this creator has already drawn the boundaries creator. Come on, around the Michael people Jones. who get to draw the boundaries. And so the boundaries have already been drawn before we even get to drawing the boundaries. And that's just flagrant circular reasoning. A Christian is someone who... Like I said, it's, it's, not, it's not circular reasoning because if you have to decide who gets a seat at the table... 
we would dismiss at the outset anybody who self-identifies, who only self-identifies as a Christian. Because even when they say that word, they me- there's meaning. What does it mean when they say that they are a Christian? Oh, well, I believe X, Y, and Z. Boom. Now we've got criteria. So, Dan, I know you're highly educated. It's, this is really annoying to me uh, that you wouldn't even think two steps beyond what you're proposing here. Who holds to orthodox beliefs and doctrines, the faith that was handed down from the apostles and what is taught in scripture. If you reject an essential doctrine, like the Trinity or the physical resurrection of Jesus, you're rejecting an essential aspect of what it is to be a Christian. Therefore, we will not accept that you're a Christian. So there are three main fallacies going on here. First, we have that... All right, let's see it. ...circular reasoning of drawing boundaries so that we can determine who gets to be in the group that draws those same boundaries. Nope, we've already defeated uh, But we that also one. have an appeal to definition, this notion that you can reduce conceptual categories and particularly social identities to a short list of necessary and sufficient features. But Yes, yes, you can. So it's... It's not a fallacy. When someone says, I am a Christian, what do they mean? What do they mean when people say that term? There is meaning with the term. But that's not how conceptual categories and particularly social identities are developed, are learned, or are used. So appealing to such features is a fallacy. And finally, this list of necessary and sufficient features actually excludes pretty much all Christians who lived during the life of Jesus or within two or three generations of his life. Since the Trinity and the concept of Jesus as fully God and fully man are much later and very complex. All right, so this is Dan's best critique here. Uh, The best critique here is that, well, even in the early church, they didn't have the, the concept of the Trinity doctrinally developed. All right, well, so let's deal with this. Go back to my second chart, right? When I created the time, the 3D time cone uh, between orthodoxy, orthopraxy, and time. In that same way, I think we can say that the definition of a Christian has evolved, it's grown, it's gotten better uh, as time has gone on. We have better understood the faithful teaching of the apostles, we've better understood the teachings of Jesus himself as we have spent time to sit down and reflect on these things. Now, what caused that development was the pursuit of truth, was the pursuit of individuals who believed that the scriptures taught one thing and others thought, no, that's not quite right. That's not quite what has been taught what has been passed on, what the scriptures themselves say. And so we have these heretical debates that more times than not resulted in in a viewpoint or even a person being deemed heretical, okay? So Arianism, a classic example. Pelagianism, another one. So Arianism is a Trinitarian and Christological heresy. So these things developed over time as we could think more and reflect on what Jesus' teachings were. So it is a, what you present here, Dan, is a good critique. It's a good concern, but it's not insurmountable because we can have broader latitude, uh, more forgiveness on uh, people believing uh, inaccurate things about the text if things are young, immature, not developed. But we're looking at fully or more more fully developed uh, doctrine and mature, spiritually mature individuals. Philosophical frameworks that developed within specific historical and social contexts. And so nobody living in the first, second, and even into the third centuries CE would have qualified as Christian according to this specific list of necessary and sufficient features. And while apologists will insist that, even though we don't see the articulation of these ideologies until the 4th and 5th centuries CE, we can assume they uh, were in circulation earlier. The data don't support that, and that's not the academic consensus. Okay, we'll probably stop there for time's sake. Um, But we do see the concepts uh, before their proper formal formulation before their canonization, you do see some of the concepts being uh, uh, presented. And the question is, do those concepts 
fit faithfully with the teaching of the church? That's the question. Okay, so uh, John 1 demonstrates Arianism is false. All right, so if you want to be an Arian, you could do that. That's just beyond the boundaries. It's beyond the fence posts of what it means to be a Christian. All right, now the Mormons believe in multiple gods, the existence of multiple gods. Jesus is simply an exalted man, was created uh, that God the Father had physical relations with Mary, and that's how Jesus was born. Okay, that is so far from what even the early Christians believed about Jesus. It is so beyond. It's a novelty. It is a novelty to the Christian teaching. Uh, so, Mormons are not Christians for that and plenty other reasons. Mm -hmm.